Hi, so I'm going to talk about Parquet and Aero, both um, columnar formats. One in particular is on disk, optimized for on disk, and the other one for in memory. So before we start, um, just a little bit about myself. If you're wondering where my accent comes from, I'm French, and I live in California, so I guess that will be some mix, but I guess it's more French accent than anything else. Um, so I'm working at Dremio, and we work on big data analytics solution. Um, before that, I worked at Twitter on data platform where I started working, making Parquet. And I'm an Apache member and currently being involved with Parquet and Aero, the incubator, formerly uh, working on Pig. So today, um, I'm going to talk about a few things. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about the benefits of columnar formats, in particular in uh, data processing, data analysis, uh, query execution. And then I'm going to talk about another very important thing is driving uh, standards in the community, in the open source, so that we can actually build an ecosystem with all those systems. Because you've been hearing about Spark and Hadoop and Impala and all those things. And really, there are a lot of things you can choose from. And they can work together, but they can work together only if we have standards, data formats in between. So first, I'm going to talk about uh, benefits of columnar formats, you know, with a kit and slides, so that looks good for the internet. So a columnar layout. If you think of um, like any type of table, so here I have a simple example of a logical table. We have three columns, A, B, and C. And we are, when we represent it in a computer, whether it's on disk or in memory, you need a linear representation when you have all the data uh, one bit after the other. So if you choose a row layout, you're going to put each row after the order, so you will have A1, B1, C1, A2, B2, C2, and values for each column interleaves. And each column would be a different type, so you have data from different types interleave like that. When you have a columnar layout, you choose to put all the values for one column together first, and then all the values for the second column, and then all the values for the third column, which means that you're going to put together values that all are, are all of the same type, and are all much more homogeneous, and that will have several advantage, advantages. Um, first, when you're doing uh, analysis and you're doing a SQL query on some data set, typically the data set has many columns, uh, maybe dozens, maybe hundreds, depending. Uh, but when you're doing a query and you're analyzing something, you're accessing only a few of those columns. So the columnar layout will make it easy to access only those columns, because instead of scanning the entire data, and doing a lot of small seeks on the data set, you're just going to be able to read entire big chunks of the columns you need, and then do big jumps. A few big jumps is much more efficient than a lot of tiny ones. And another aspect is when compressing data, because we put together all values from the same type, instead of having a string, an int, a string, an int, we have a bunch of strings or a bunch of integers, we can compress all, them all together much more efficiently. For example, let's say you have an integer value and you know the maximum value for the entire column, then you can use only the number of bits that are required for this maximum value and you can bit pack them together to use a lot less memory than four bytes per value and make it much more compact. And similarly, if you're compressing strings with regular brute force algorithm, being it the, uh, you know, either the zip, uh, LZW family type of algorithm, or snappy, or regular ones, the algorithm will be much more efficient because you're putting together things that are more homogeneous instead of mixing a lot of different things together. So I've been saying that Parquet is for on disk, Arrow is for in memory, but really I started by building Parquet for on disk uh, storage. And really, you could ask, why don't you put just Parquet in memory? And the main reason is um, because there are different trade-offs that we want to make and optimize the format for different access patterns. So when we talk about disk storage, 
Um, the same, you're going to write the data once, and it's going to be accessed by many different queries that may access different columns. So the access pattern on which column it's accessing, it's, it's, it has to be written once, and it's going to be reused many times. And when we read the data, it's mostly streaming, right? We're, we're going to read all the values one after the other. Possibly we're going to skip whole chunks, and I'm going to talk about that. But we mostly access them in order. Um, and so there's a priority to I.O. reduction, even though we still want good CPU throughput, but the priority is I.O. reduction in this case. For an in-memory data structure, it's more transient. So it's being built on the fly for the purpose of the execution of a query of doing some processing on it. Like, for example, if you're doing a SQL query, it's going to build only those columns that you're querying and the access could be either we're looking at all the values, or in other cases, you may want to have random access to individual values. For example, you're doing a join, um, and it's doing a join in memory. It may have want to access different uh, values, or referring to values for uh, indexing in data structures. So you're doing some indexing, and you're referencing the index of the value. So in Parquet, we don't necessarily optimize for constant access to a value in the list. Uh, in Arrow, it's optimized for constant access time um, of the value. And so in memory, we really want to prioritize for CPU throughput. So we still need good I.O. and representation, but it's really the CPU throughput that's most important. So now I'm going to talk a little bit both uh, first about Parquet and in more details on how it works, and then I'll talk about Arrow. So first, they both support nested data structures, so I listed it for both uh, format because real-life data structures are nested, and we have a list of nested objects and structures um, several la layers deep. And second, it's a compact format, so one thing it provides is better compression um, than a regular raw-oriented with um, brute force compression algorithm on top. Um, that's because of the type of wearing encodings. If we have a bunch of integers, we know the max value, we can make them more compact. Or if we know it's a bunch of uh, strings, we can also do a dictionary encoding, which means build a dictionary and encode only integers, and that's much more compact. And other things like that. And we get better compression just by the columnar layout and putting together things that look the same as opposed to interleaving values that look different. And so it can do optimize I.O. by the projection pushdown, which is reading only the columns you need, and filter pushdowns, which is taking advantage of statistics that are part of the file to skip entire chunks of the file. <clears throat> so one of the main uh, advantages of columnar storage on disk for queries is first you access only the column you need because you can do a scan on only those columns you need to load. And based on statistics in the files, you can skip whole chunks of the data. Let's say you filter by a certain range. If you know the minimum value and maximum value in each chunk, you can, and those minimum value don't match the range, you know you can skip the entire block. And you can skip entire chunks of the data set. So that with both vertical and horizontal partitioning, you limit the I.O. to the minimum. And, um, and so this slide is about nesting because all my examples on slide are simple and flat schemas. But really, uh, Parquet supports nested data structure. And this is just giving an idea of how um, nested structures are turned into a flat representation. But we capture all the nestings with repetition and all this. And if you want more details, there's a link uh, on the page with a blog post that goes into details on how that works. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about Arrow. So like I said, it also supports nested data structures, and it's optimized for CPU throughput on modern CPUs. And I'll go a little bit into how modern CPUs work and why it's important to understand how they work to present the data in a way that is going to be processed efficiently. So things to think about are pipelining, uh, CMD instruction are single instruction, multiple data. Those are extended instructions on processors that say do the same operation on those four values at a time. And cache locality, and because processors have cache on them, that is much faster to access than main memory. 
And the other aspect of arrow is because the in-memory representation is, um, is the format you work on. It can, we can use scatter, gather IO. There's no serialization when you send it over the network. There's no extra CPU work to transform the in-memory representation to the wire representation. We just send the in-memory representation on the wire and read it back on the other end, and that's all you need. So typically, in uh, systems that send data over the wire, if you use Thrift or Protobuf or whatever, you have your in-memory representation, and then you need to serialize it into your wire representation, which takes a lot of CPU. So uh, in this mode, uh, the goal is to make everything one representation and to remove all that overhead. So this slide is about CPU pipelining. So if you think of modern CPUs, you know, they don't execute one instruction after the other anymore. So that was valid, the first CPUs that were made. Now, CPU instructions are decomposed into like 12 um, steps. And what the CPU is trying to do, because not all the area of the CPU is used at once, is trying to prepare, start processing the next instruction before the previous one is finished, which means we have staggered execution of instruction which means that you need to be able to know what the next instruction is going to be before the previous instruction is done. And so to do that, the CPU is trying to guess. There's a branch predictor, what's called the branch predictor, and the CPU is going, because sometimes if you have an if in your code, if the value was this, do that, if the value was something else, do this, um, then that's a branch, and that's where the CPU is going to do one thing or the other. That means a different execution instruction is going to be Cold, and that's called a data dependency, right? So like the next instructions depend on the result of the current one, which means we need to wait, which is what you see here. So here you have four imaginary instructions, A, B, C, D, and you can imagine that's like a Tetris brick falling to the bottom with time. So we are moving downwards as time goes on. And so in a perfect world, we start, and I have a pipeline of four steps, like imaginary pipeline, we start preparing instruction A and it goes through the CPU pipeline and after four cycles of the CPU, it's done. And we do all the same thing for the instruction. We assume they're all independent. We can all process them staggered and we do, you know, four on average, we do four instruction, we do one instruction per cycle on average. But if we were wrong and when we A is finished, we realize, well, wait a minute, we were not having the right instruction. We need to start over and start another instruction, right? We need to wait until this one is finished. Then we have what you call a bubble, and you're losing the entire number of CPUs of the length, the depth of your pipeline, which means you can lose up to 12 cycles. So there's a huge difference between writing code that will we have independent instruction that can go in par almost in parallel versus something that will introduce bubbles where the CPU always has to wait before starting uh, executing the next instruction. And so that's where columnar is very important because you're going to do the exact same thing on all the values over and over. And because you're writing your code in that way, you have a, have a tight loop that says, hey, do this on all the values. So, Increment the index, do the processing on the value, write the result, increment the index, do the processing, which means it's always doing the same thing in the tight loop instead of you know, looking at all the values of your tuple and doing different things. And doing much more efficient and taking much more advent uh, advantage of the processor pipeline. So that's the reason, and you, know, you can refer to the Monet DB paper, which is like the uh, inventor of vectorized execution in databases. And that's basically the main advantage, is we use the most of the CPU. It doesn't have to wait to know what to do next. And the part about the cache locality, like, you know, you have the main memory of your computer, there's a bus in between, and there's a CPU, and the cache is right on the CPU. So accessing the cache is much faster. So the CPU will say, whenever it needs to access memory, it will go to the RAM, say, send me that data will go over and then processes it. And what it will try to do is try to keep working on the same amount of memory and write on it locally because it can do, go very fast in reading and writing in the cache. And only when we need um, to fetch more data, we send over data that we're done working with, then we will have this latency. So, and here, every time we go through the bus, the processor has to wait to get the next thing. 
So big f and in uh, columnar execution, because we work on one column at a time and we do the same thing, we get better cache locality than if we get all the rows. You remember when we, in a raw oriented representation in memory, we get all the different values. So we have to execute all the instructions for all the values, like evaluate expression for one row at a time. So data is more heterogeneous and we do more things. And so there's more back and forth between RAM and CPU. And if we do columnar, there's more locality because we, we can keep it tighter to the thing we're working on. <clears throat> and so all those points about CPU efficiency, um, so basically I've talked about those things. And like it's just a representation that show you different types and how they interleave or they're the same. And the one thing I didn't talk about was CMD, single instruction, multiple data. And in such cases, the CPU is operation instruction that you say, hey, process that same thing on four value in parallel. So when you use those instructions, it's plain 4x throughput, right? Because it's just a processor will be four, four instruction in parallel, totally. And so that's um, thanks to uh, columnar representation that's very easy to say, hey, we're going to do four times the same instruction again and again. So to give you a little idea of how the arrow nested representation works, if we look at uh, name is a variable length value, right? It's a string. So in value, the first value is three bytes long. The second value is four bytes long. So you have an offset array that delimits points to the beginning of each value. Uh, age is a fixed length value. So you have a plain array of all the values one after the other because they're fixed length. And for phones, which is a list of strings, you can see that you can compose those things, right? So we have a, a variable length values, which are strings, and I'm you know, truncating it here so that it fits in the slide. We have the offset that delimits the strings, and then we have another offset vector that points to the beginning of each string. So the first list has two elements, the second list has one element, so you can see that the lens are presented by the first and second offset. We have two elements, one element, and they both point to the beginning of the values in there. So another thing for the in-memory processing is Arrow comes with um, a memory allocator based on Netty and a notion of tree, a tree of allocators so that he can deal with quotas and um, providing memory because when you have a query execution, uh, you want to understand which operator in the query execution is doing what and how much memory it's using and limit how much its operator is using. For example, you may have a hash join and also another operator that applies a function to the values and they both will use memory. And you want to be able to allocate different quotas so that the join may want to spill data to disk and things like that. So now the, the other very important part of this is to build that as a community-driven standard. Because it's not just about the technology. The thing is, uh, there's a common need, like a lot of projects, and I'm sure some quotes, are looking into columnar execution. Because since the MonetDB paper, that's a natural evolution. That's how we are going to make all those SQL execution or query much faster, like in Impala, in Spark SQL, in Drill. Um, in all those systems. And so all those projects are looking at those things. And so the goal is to make that we may as well all do it the same way. And at least for the in-memory representation, and that will have a lot of benefits for the ecosystem and enabling intercommunication between all those systems. The other benefits, of course, is to share the effort and building that thing together instead of reinventing the same thing 10 times. But really, um, sharing the effort is something that, that's one driving force, but that would not be enough, right? Like, it's not because it's the right thing to do to implement something once that people have different opinion, but the other driving vector to agreeing on how we want, we're going to do this is to be able to be interoperable after the while. And so bail on success of Parquet, Parquet started as like just Cladera and the Impala team and me at Twitter trying to build a standard and after being very open to accept the drill communities, uh, 
Spark community, and then it started becoming a standard, kind of grassroots um, thing, and it worked really well. But now this community is built, right? Those people already have interacted and negotiated how this thing is supposed to work. So based on that, now it's easier to build Arrow and do the same thing for the in-memory processing. So it's really a standard from the start. And so I had a few quotes about the Impala team, about the Spark team, talking about well, the drill team, about you know, how vectorized execution and columnar in memory is important. And I'm sure you've heard it in other talks. So some of the error goals are to have a well-documented and cross-language compatible spec. And you know, I talked about how it's designed to take advantage of modern CPUs. And it's embeddable in those, all those execution engines. And the goal is not to replace a huge part of everything. The goal is to agree on the format and be interoperable, have a few libraries in common, and let every engine innovate in what is specific to them. Whether it's Flink, whether it's Spark SQL, whether it's Impala, whether it's Apache Drill, all those things um, provide their own value. And you know, having this common library doesn't prevent them from doing their own thing. But it's interoperable. So the Arrow project started, so it officially was created at the Apache Foundation on, in February. And the member of the PMC come from all those, um, all those projects. <coughs> so you recognize a lot of Apache projects of other things. And <coughs> all those people are getting together. And the goal is to make sure it's really something that we all agree on so that it really becomes a success and it's uh, the beginning of the ecosystem. So things like you recognize in this, both query engines like Drill, Impala, um, Pandas, uh, Spark, uh, Storm, R, and also uh, storage layers like Parquet, Kudu, Hadoop, uh, Cassandra, and those things will have to interact uh, very closely. So we'll talk a little bit about this eco how to build this ecosystem and why it's important. So today, um, when you want to integrate things, you can need one-to-one -one integration in all those systems. Uh, like, for example, Parquet vectorized code, there's some that lives in Spark, some that lives in Drill, some that lives in Impala, and they all like their own slightly different implementation of it. And they all have their own in-memory representation that is either columnar or not. Some are raw-oriented in memory, some are columnar-oriented. And it's really, it's a mess, like every project needs to integrate with the other one. They need to find a format that will be standard in between the two. There's probably going to be serialization, deserialization to convert from one format to the other. It's inefficient and there's a lot of uh, work duplication. And typically, when you hear about talks about people who do profiling, they realize that a lot of CPU is wasted on serialization, deserialization, but it's something that you're stuck with if all the system didn't agree on what format they were going to talk up front. So with Arrow, notice like complex, simple, um, yeah, Arrow becomes like a standard that helps uh, make things easy to communicate because if everyone agree on the in-memory format, like we're doing, um, then they can integrate once and then everything works together because there's a common columnar format that is efficient for processing and also is standard so we can just send it across the wire. There's no override for cross-system communication so we get a lot of CPU saving not by optimizing stuff but just by agreeing on how we're going to transfer it. And um, there's opportunities for sharing functionality. For example, you can make something that converts Parquet to a row in memory Share, make it really good, share it once, and then everybody's using it. So now, you know, instead of having variable performance querying Parquet depending on the system you're using, like currently, for example, uh, Hive sometimes is less good than uh, Spark or Drill that are really uh, committed to use Parquet very well. Instead, like everybody will have like, very good benefits, and we don't like spend the effort in each project to make that very good. So language bindings, um, Parquet started with, um, I did all the Java bindings, so they were like Java libraries that were used in uh, Spark SQL, in Drill, in many other places. And there was C++ code, but that was like tightly coupled with the Impala code. Now there's an effort by Wes McKinney, uh, who works at Cloudera, 
has been doing a very good CPP, C++ library that can be reused for all the C++ code. In particular, he's interested in integrating with Python and Pandas, which is like big data library. Like for people who use R, they like to use Pandas in Python as well. And on Arrow, there's a Java implementation, the C++ implementation, same usual suspect is being done by Wes. And once you have a C++ implementation, you can integrate with all those um, native code-based code. Uh, JVM languages like Java or Scala can use uh, the Java implementation. And the primary initial focus we say here, it's the read, write, manage memory, because there's all um, RPC uh, layers that could be shared, and right now it's not a common library. But the main thing is once you agree on the format, you don't need to put all the tools in, in one library, but it's uh, valuable to share the effort on some of those pieces. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the RPC, Remote Procedure Call, and IPC, Inter-Process Communication, which uh, basically either sending the data to some other machine on the cluster or sharing the data in between two processes on the same node. <clears throat> so a little bit on how you look at the data. So we say the representation is columnar, but we don't really load the entire data set in memory. Right? The data set will be logically split in record batches, like seen here. And really, when you're doing a query execution or machine learning or whatever it is on this data in memory, uh, you're going to work on the subset of data at a time. Like it's just all map reduce thing, right? You load a bunch of data, you do some processing, you send it over, you load the next thing. And so up front, you need, need to define the schema for what vectors you're going to find in your data. Uh, optionally, you can have a dictionary batch for, you know, instead of uh, keeping variable length values, you can build a dictionary and replace them by IDs, which is fixed length integers, and there are a lot of values for query execution of having fixed length values instead of variable length, right? If you're doing an aggregation, instead of keeping a hash table of the values to keep incrementing the counts, you just keep a plain array, and instead of looking up a hash, you directly look up the index of the values, right? Because when you build a dictionary, like IDs for that dictionary will be between zero and n, they will be packed and you can just build an array and do a much faster aggregation evaluation like that. <clears throat> so you have schema, optionally, dictionary, and then a bunch of record batches representing the data. And if we drill down in that, uh, so in a single record batch, you have a data header that des describes some offsets, and then you will have each vectors representing the data. So if you remember that example, I had on the other slide, you have the vectors for the name. So the bitmap is for is it null or not? You know, we just keep zero or one to say if it's null. Then the offset is, remember, name is a variable length value. So we say where the value starts. And then the actual data, which is all the values one after the other. Edge is fixed width. So we have a bitmap to say if it's null or not. And then uh, we have all the values one after another, and so on. So each vector is contiguous in memory. It doesn't have to be contiguous. Uh, all the vectors don't have to be contiguous one after the other in memory, because when you're building them, each one is a different stream, right? We add values to them. But once we send them over the wire, because they're going to be written, like we're going to tell the network layer to say, hey, write this to network, work this to network, and so on and so forth. On the other end, is going to be a tightly packed data structures with all the column after one another. So when you receive it, it's a nice packed pack data structure. So the main thing about moving data between systems. So in RPC, we want to avoid serialization, deserialization. So we just uh, we can send the data, but avoiding transformation because the wire format is different from the in-memory format. And we make uh, I've written here layer TBD. Um, because we haven't shared yet as a standard library how to do the read writes and like each system does its thing. Uh, but it's going to be a shared library to how to send those packets. But really, um, 
really it's very simple, right? We have this record batch representation, just send it over the wire with a proper header. And for IPC, we have um, a prototype using uh, memory mapped files and for integration with, between drill and Python. And you can imagine, you have your, so Apache Drill is an, uh, it's written in Java, it is a SQL engine written in Java, so currently you write your user-defined function in Java, but with Euro, because Drill is using Euro in its in-memory representation, and actually, I'm going to show the, that slide about this, Sorry, it's truncated, but if you have your SQL engine producing Euro, it can pass a pointer to it to a different process, which is Python, which is not running on the JVM, that can read this data. Uh, I, I know the previous uh, talk talked about it's bad to have shared memory, but in there you have to remember that this is an immutable piece of data, right? We write a record batch. Uh, we finalize it, now it's immutable, it's not going to change anymore, and we share a pointer to it in read-only, when it's going to be read only by this process. And now this process can produce a new record batch, which is the output of what this user-defined function is doing, and this can be passed back to the, SQL op to the next SQL operator, to the query execution engine. And what that means is that there's zero overhead to do cross-process communication, Interprocess communication, and because we can just have share pointer to an immutable data structure, produce a new one, and share pointer to the result with a new immutable data structure. And that means that now you can use Python to do your favorite UDFs instead of having to do whatever each um, system is implementing um, as a user defined function framework or interface. And that means once you wrote it for Python, in Python for, let's say, Drill, it's going to work for Spark. It's going to work for Impala. Because they all, they, now the interface between the two is error. So first we remove all cost of, you know, it's not going to be JNI with the overhead of calling a native from Java. And it's not going to have to convert the representation to another one. It's all standard, so there's no overhead of interprocess communication. And it's standard, which means those user-defined functions, they will work for each um, query engine. And if I go back, uh, so that was for inter-process communication. And for RPC, I have an example of um, what a query execution physical plan looks like. And so this example is select sum of A from T group by B. And so, you start by scanning Parquet files, and really, like we did before, we're going to read only those two columns and turn them into arrow columns in memory. And then here we have three lines because there are three machines in my cluster. So that's machine one, machine two, machine three. It's three nodes. And each machine, we do partial aggregation and prepare blocks for doing a shuffle and send to their machine, right? So we take the key space, and using consistent hashing or whatever mechanism, we're going to decide which machine will be responsible for the total aggregation view of that particular key. And so based on that, you can prepare, if we have three nodes in our cluster, each node will prepare three outputs with a partial aggregation result um, for each uh, set of keys, and then this is going to be sent over the wire. So here we stay on the same machine, so there's no copy. But if we go on another machine, we just send this over the wire, there's no extra serialization, deserialization uh, logic, it's just copied right over. And then the final aggregation, which is combining those three views together, is done, and then when sending the result set to the client, it's just same thing again. The in-memory representation is just sent over the wire directly to the client. <coughs> And so, really, that's it, right? Because the in-memory representation is the same as the wire representation. We remove all this overhead of converting things. And also, each step, you know, you can imagine loading from Kudu. Kudu is columnar representation on disk. And currently, when you use a Kudu client, 
uh, it's going to convert it into assemble those columns to present it to the client in a row oriented form and and then if it's if you're reading that with Apache drill for example it's going to turn it back into column narrow presentation so it kind of you go back and forth which is really inefficient when once uh, they're both integrated with arrow uh, it's going to go directly from the column narrow presentation of kudu to the in-memory column narrow presentation, and you don't go back and forth between column narrow and oriented. And on that, um, you know, almost done. So the next step is to do the shared parquet URL conversion. I've uh, add those shared library. So there's already a common format that all those projects have agreed on. Now all we need is some shared libraries, and. Uh, do the integration in some of them. And there's also uh, interest in uh, the Intel persistent memory library called At Apache Me Mnemonic is looking into that. And so persistent memory is not really interesting because it's persistent, or at least not yet. It's interesting because it's a layer in between SSD, like disk, and memory, which is slightly higher latency than RAM, but it's much cheaper. You can have a lot more of it for the price, so it's kind of having a good compromise in between. So if you want to join the conversation, like get more interested in this, um, you can lo look at the dev mailing list, or uh, follow the Twitter accounts, and uh, I'll be open to questions. Are we done? Thank yeah. you for the presentation. <laughs> So I see there is a question here. I was just wondering, um, what if you need to transport the data from a little endian to a big endian uh, system and vice versa? How would you handle that? So, uh, so the endian X is fixed. So most system, sorry, I um, always forget which one is which. But um, for example, the Java default representation is the wrong one. So can someone remind me which one is the most common that we use all the time? It's uh, Little Indian, right? So every uh, hardware system right now, it's either Little Indian or it supports both, right? Like, I think that's the point. So it's going to be a uh, Little Indian. And Java is Big Indian by default, right? That's, I'm correct, right? Because I always got confused. So Parquet is Little Indian, and because we were uh, uh, we were working with the Impala team, and their uh, system is in C++. So they want to be able to do the trick when you know, they cast an array of integers into an array of bytes, and it's going to do the right thing. Uh, so it's all Little Indian by default. So it's the same here. There's not going to be any conversion, because the format is defined as it's all Little Indian, and that's it. So you don't need to know what the system is underneath, because I believe, unless someone knows of something else, Little Indian is the best default choice for current ad hardware at the time. It's kind of big Indian is kind of outdated nowadays. So from practical standpoint, this is not a problem. No, because it's not the big a problem. Indian hardware isn't there. Yeah, it's not the choice you get uh, to make uh, on Indianness. Uh, the, the format has one Indianness, and that's the way it is. And there's no need to know what the system does because part of the standard is you have to do Little Indian. I'm not going to take sides over the religious issue of ending this. I'm just going to observe this is actually a complete repetition of the religious war between Apollo and Sun in about 1989 about the wire format of um, Apollo RPC versus um, NFS. And of course, NFS is what their policy recipient makes good. Basically saying, rather than have a stable wire format, we're going to produce what we... No, I'm confused. You've basically hard-coded the exact opposite of what Sun got through with NFS, haven't you? So you've basically said Intel, oh, okay. Intel is the part that wins. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just, you know, server-side, it actually makes sense. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm curious about uh, spilling. So when the memory is too low to hold a narrow file in memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like all these systems that do in-memory processing, uh, the one thing you want to look at is how does the system behave when the dataset doesn't fit in memory. 
So arrow doesn't define that, right? Arrow defines how you represent a given record batch, which is a subset of your data set. So it defines that you're going to be able to split your data set in record batches and have each chunk in memory at a time. And then it's kind of up to each system how they do it. So typically, like for example, if you do a join or if you're doing aggregations, you're going to spill to disk, right? So let's say I'm doing aggregation and I keep the keys and the current values. And then at some point, the key set doesn't fit in memory anymore. So you're going to spill something. And if, you, if I go back to this, for example, in the aggregation, that's a good example. Because here it's simplified, you know, and there's only one record batch, and then there's only one record batch for each of those things. But it doesn't need to be, right? So here, what we can do is we're building those partial aggregation in memory. So I'm doing the sum from the point of view of that node. And then when I want the global sum, I, I, I sum all those partial sums together and I get the global sum. Which means then here, if I run out of memory at this point, I can spill to disk or you know, send it to the next one directly and say, hey, I'm partially done. There are too many distinct keys. I cannot keep it in memory any anymore. I can spill it to disk and do you know, a disk-based merge on this side or send it over and start a new one and start aggregated for the other keys. Right? And that's still correct because uh, sum is an uh, associative operation. right? So you can do this part of the sum and then A, it doesn't fit in memory because I have too many distinct keys, flush it to disk, start over, and the contract is but just sum them all, sum them all on the other end, and you can do a disk-based uh, sum. Maybe I was sorting the keys on purpose so that this is more efficient when I write it to disk or something. So that's one example. So basically, uh, the system that uses Arrow will have to implement some strategies, right? Um, so you can start aggregating, and then it doesn't fit anymore. You save it, you write it to disk, you keep going in memory as much as you can, and then you combine the results. Um, and of course, if you spill to disk, then you take a hit. It's going to be much faster if it all fits in memory. But it's like it's a typical query execution problems. And uh, what are the trade-offs? So that's where also the, this format needs to be as compact as possible for in memory because you want to do as much as you can directly in memory, right? So avoid overhead of pointers and things. So columnar is good for that as well, because um, you know, if you have an array of objects that points to other values, you add the overhead of a lot, like in Java, typically of a lot of references, with C structs that would not be a problem. But let's say if you do the typical, like uh, how a lot of those systems started, they had a list of Java, like if you look at how pig works, back in the day, you, have a, you would have a list of tuple object, and a tuple object is a map of string name, field name, to the actual value, which is very inefficient, uses a lot of memory, but the columnar representation like that is more compact. So the, the game is, as much as possible, do everything in memory. If it doesn't work anymore, you need to fall back to disk, or do something, send partial results, and there are going to be more work involved, but have some kind of trade-off. So, um, by the way, yeah. We have one last question, but you have to keep it really short. Okay. As you can take it offline. So, it's going to be a yes or no answer. No, no, I'm just kidding. Thanks That's for right. the talk. Uh, you said uh, Avro packages or blocks, they are immutable. Are there plans to introduce versioning or updates? Or do you uh, always think you update the on disk format and then you per query load in memory Arrow packages and you yeah. never want to reuse them in the future? Um, so, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer your question, but so I've said this is like transient in memory, yeah. but you can reuse the same format for spilling to disk or like do a on disk cache, right? You can temporarily serialize it to disk or, or do a lot of stuff or keep it, keep an in memory cache as well. Um, sorry, can you repeat? Maybe we can take it offline. Which part was important to you? So uh, I think the initial assumption is it's you create it once per query. Uh, yeah. So sorry, I missed that part. So yeah, you you're free to modify the content. It's not it's not just happen only. You're free to go edit a value. Maybe you're doing aggregations, right? And you keep updating that sum in the arrow you have in memory, and you have some pointers pointing to it, and that's fine. It's just when you're done writing to this record batch and you finalize it, basically you're saying I'm not modifying it anymore. 
And at that point, it becomes immutable. It doesn't have to be immutable from the start or happen only. You can mutate it as much as you want, but you're a single writer to it. And then you finalize it and you say, it's immutable now, other people can read it and then can read it in parallel and it's fine because nobody else is mutating it. And that's, that's the theory behind that. And also, one thing I wanted to precise is, this is typically not being, going to be visible from the user code, instead of, in, unless you're doing some special integration between two of those systems so that you're actually contributing to making Arrow work everywhere. Uh, but basically, usually it's hidden in the system, right? So when Impala uses it or Drill uses it, it's, it's internal representation, it's not something that you see. Uh, or they're going to be a client that abstracts it out for you. Thanks. And so I'm like, thank you, and we can, uh, you know, we can have drinks and uh, talk more about that stuff uh, afterwards. Thank, thank you. you so much, Julian. <laughs> <laughs>